Kipsevich and the lab manager here at the Archaeological Research Facility. And we, um, together with my co presenter, Chris Hoffman, we are going to uh, introduce this instrument, this, this display system that was uh, acquired from the first museum a few years ago. And it presents a lot of opportunities for research in archaeology. So we'd like to introduce it to the community and uh, let people know it's here. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone. It's great to see you, both the people in person as well as online. Thank you. I'm Chris Hoffman. I uh, actually did a PhD here in the anthropology department. I was telling some folks earlier, I wrote my thesis right there in that other room, spent many years with, with my advisor, Ruth Tran, who's actually here in the room. So thank you, Ruth, for, for coming and joining us today. So yes, as Nico said, what we're going to be doing is we're actually launching what I hope will become a new tool in our toolkit, a, uh, a, a visualization resource that was at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology for a number of years and is now available here in the Archaeological Research Facility. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we've done so far, how we use the, the, this visualization wall, what it is, um, how it's been used in the past, and then what some ideas we might we have for, for future use of this facility. And I'm really hoping we can actually have some discussion, both with folks online as well as here in the room, about your ideas about how this could be useful for, for archaeologists, for archaeological research, you know, written you know, broadly. So yes, uh, this is just kind of the outline here. Both Nico and I have been working on this, thinking about different ideas for ways to use this as a resource, and then we'll, we'll have some open discussion. So first of all, what is what is the arcade? And by the way, the, the name arcade is a is a placeholder. We can call this what we want, right? Part of this is to invent this, and so that name is not its permanent name. But I really ask you all to help come up with a name that seems more you know suitable to to this as a resource for archaeologists, including graduate students, faculty, people within anthropology, people in in other departments across Canada. CAVE stands for, and I think this is fresh, but this is a little bit of a guess, computer-aided visualization environment. Right? This is actually a technology that was kind of developed in the 90s, uh, in the early days of virtual reality. You know, there are computer scientists at, uh, we have some colleagues at UC San Diego who are really interested in both virtual reality, but also these large screen display environments. And uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story there. One, one of the archaeologists, one of the one of the computer scientists, Tom Levy, he's really motivated by getting away from really expensive proprietary systems. So, you know, if you work in the museum industry, you know that you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a visualization environment. And one company owns it; they own the hardware, they own the software, and they install it and they run it for you. He was really motivated by the, the idea of you know, going to a store, buying some, buying a computer, buying some screen, and just making it work. So he was really kind of driven by you know, coming up with affordable approaches to these very expensive technologies. So this is essentially just a Windows 10 computer uh, that has six 65-inch TVs attached to it. Um, the computer is a pretty beefy, powerful one. Uh, one of the features of this is it has two GPU cards, a graphics processing unit card that um, is really designed for you know, computer computer games, video games. But it's also it's just for visual processing of data and information. There are other applications that um, are really interesting within archaeology, where you know, we have a lot of data, but really you know, there's so much in the visual environment that that we really love to capture and present in different ways. So that's what, what, the, the, what, is, what this is, the cave is actually a computer, uh, you know, with cables sticking through uh, that window there and it's in the back of the, uh, our computer lab. All right, so where did it come from? Well, that's UC Berkeley participated in a UC-wide project that was called At-Risk at -risk Cultural Heritage at risk world heritage and the digital humanities. Right? I'm trying to speak to the microphone here without looking at my slides. So this was uh, actually a partnership amongst four University of California campuses. 
uh, led by colleagues at UC San Diego. Uh, the, the PI here at Berkeley was Benjamin Porter, who at the time was the director of the first museum of anthropology. And the idea of, the, of this project was to distribute these visual visualizations of cultural heritage sites at the different UC campuses, make them available in museums and libraries on the UC campuses, uh, and have a repository of visual information of visualizations in one place down at UC San Diego. And they involve people in the libraries at UC San Diego to be part of the, the solution there. So there'd be actually curated content from places like Egypt and the Middle East, and especially you know, cultural heritage at risk. And, and kind of tagline there was at risk from natural forces of erosion or you know, human forces of terrorism was one of the, the big motivations because these were archaeologists working in the, the Near East who were very concerned about sites they could no longer they could no longer get access to. So um, we brought one of these visualization cave environments, this one here in fact, to the Hearst Museum of Anthropology and we installed it right when the Hearst Museum was reopening after its renovation. And so what was that, 2017, 2018, approximately, that we installed this in the first museum of anthropology, where it was actually really, you know, a, a, a wonderful experience where we worked with students and anthropologists and the museum profession, professionals to um, do a number of things. But one of the main focuses was, was photogrammetry, developing three-dimensional models of objects in the museum collection. So you can see here, we have a, a couple of objects that we worked on. Now, this was myself and a number of students from the campus, undergraduate students. I had never done photogrammetry before, nor had the students. So we worked with people like Michael Ashley, who's a former colleague, of, a current colleague of ours who has been trained in photogrammetry. We worked with other people who had Develop this skill in photogrammetry, but we were we were kind of self-taught, so I've always kind of treated this as an experiment as well. But we, we made a lot of mistakes. But you can see here some pictures. There's a picture on the left there with Ben Porter, we're actually at the Hearst Museum um, collection facility, doing some initial photography of a there's basket there. We work with other museum staff, Katie Fleming there, and students on a mask. And then we branched into other objects and collections like Japanese temple uh, And again, engaging students here was actually turned out to be really one of the highlights in the work that we were doing. Uh, they were they were so excited to be learning about museums, learning about the kind of work that goes on there, getting that kind of behind the scenes kind of understanding of what happens in a museum. And we were having these days in the within the. Um, Kind of a classroom area of the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, where we would have you know, six or seven people. There's Michael Ashley is there on the on the right of that photograph, and we actually use this not only to display the models but to develop the model because those those two graphics cards, the GPUs that are part of this computer, were actually really good at taking all of these photographs of these objects and creating rendering a three dimensional model. That was, that was one of the undiscovered features of, of having this particular kind of computer. Uh, one of the things that we discovered was that actually visitors to the museum were as interested in the work we were doing as they were in the exhibits that were you know, showing in the museum. So we actually you know, ended up putting, you know, we would put our hours of work on the, the calendar of events for the first museum because people wanted to know what are you doing? What are the students doing there? What's that object? You know, what did you do wrong? That three-dimensional model is obviously not working very well. So it was, that was actually really interesting in a lot of time. Now, from that, we actually launched another a series of um, other projects in this kind of visualization space using the first day. So we became part of a, a melon funded project called Visualiz Visualizing Digital Scholarship in Libraries and Learning Spaces. And this was North Carolina State University was the, the primary on this award and Berkeley was a sub award that 
uh, what we did there is we really you know, worked with some of the other museum collections on campus, the Botanical Garden, the Herbaria, the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Archive, was the film archive and the, the library to develop three-dimensional models of objects in other kinds of collections. And this gave us opportunity to talk with people from you know, around the country who were had similar goals of developing these kind of visualization resources. Now, from there, then, um, we actually were able to install a second one of these caves in a museum over on the other side of campus, in the Citrus um, building, Citar Dai Hall. Citrus is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. And there, we, just, we installed a very similar environment in their tech museum. So if you've ever been over to Citrus, they have a tech museum where they show things that they built in their maker spaces, um, we have some other projects that they've been part of. And we have a facility like this installed there as well. So now that's, that was kind of interesting to me because that's, that's an engineering kind of context, right? So um, it's a different, and they have a lot of you know, visitors come here. It's a very high profile project over there at Citrus. So um, a different kind of environment. And we're, we're also trying to figure out how, how we make that, this resource useful in that context. The pandemic was, was a big interruption to that kind of program. Now, then, the next project that this launched was a project with Rita Lucarelli from the Eastern Studies here at UC Berkeley. Um, they, we got funding from Citrus actually to develop a virtual reality application. And for those of you who know Rita Lucarelli, her, Rita Lucarelli, her specialization is. Um, understanding texts, say, from the Book of the Dead in kind of their material three-dimensional context. So, for instance, she has done, she's developed three-dimensional models of sarcophagi in the First Museum collection and in other collections really um, around California and, and beyond. And she's interested in like, why certain parts of the text from the Book of the Dead were placed in different parts of like a, a sar sarcophagus or some other material representation. Really interesting. That's that's for and, and it's aided by developing a, a three-dimensional model of, of an object that has those. So, so I worked with Rita and then with another archaeologist down at UC Santa Cruz, Elaine Sullivan, to develop this idea, a proposal for developing a virtual reality application that would start at the context of of the, the landscape of the region of where these objects are found. We're taking down into the, the level of the landscape and the monument. From there, you would descend into the tomb. You would see the sarcophagus, and then you could actually you know, pull up translations of the hieroglyphs. <laughs> so these are some of the, you know, the raw materials that we were using as we were designing the application. And then these are some screenshots from the actual VR application, which I can uh, maybe show you know, some, some video from later if there's enough time. But we, we do start with kind of a splash screen. So on the upper left, there's kind of a, there's a, the credits on the left, there's a map of where the site of Sakara is located. And then there's you know, superimposed over the sarcophagus model, here's a button that says enter Sakara. From there, you end up kind of at the level of the landscape. This is based on work of Elaine Sullivan, who has developed kind of what she calls a 4D GIS model of this landscape. And she visualizes um, what the site looked like at different periods of time, right? And so she's done a lot of you know, GIS work and uh, building up models of building sites and landscapes. So you start at that level of the landscape, um, and then you descend underground. You can kind of see it there on the right. This, these occur in burial chambers that go between 25, 30 feet underground. You enter the tomb where you can see the doctor, kind of the, the, the sarcophagus is kind of nicknamed the doctor. And from there, you can use your pointer to click on part of the hieroglyphs, and it will bring up translations. So we'll show you the, the hieroglyphs, and then you can also see some of the translations. So this is a really, um, and, and we did this also with students. 
So, and this was really challenging to actually get to a finished product. So, as we, and I'll say that, that Rita and Elaine are thinking about the next steps with, with this project. They're actually down in, I think it's Irvine right now at a conference, and they're doing some demonstrations of this. So it's helping uh, make sure that the, that the application still runs those kinds of things uh, so that they can do their demos. But Rita, unfortunately, was not able to make it today. But as we, as we thought about what we've learned so far in this project, um, it's been really interesting. First of all, you know, we were dealing with materials that were excavated under you know, different circumstances in around 1903, 1904, right? So the, the actual stone sarcophagus that, that we were using in our, um, in our experience is in the first museum of anthropology. When, when you are able to go back in there, it's actually in the entrance to the, to the lobby of the first museum. Um, but most of the other information that we were using was from you know, publications in 1903, 1904 that had some maps and some drawings and a lot of text, but really generating kind of a three-dimensional understanding of the whole context was very challenging. So there was actually some kind of rediscovery of the archeological context that we had to go through in order to develop this model. And then I, I won't read all of these. This will also be available in the recording that we will have later. But this was really challenging because, part, partly because the technologies that we're working with, it's like the wild, wild west. The hardware is evolving, the software is evolving. There are no standards for file formats. Um, even though we're working with two Egyptologists who are working in the same, the same kind of site and cultural context, you know, one is developing three-dimensional models of sarcophagi. The other is doing kind of GIS work and building reconstructions. They're both creating three-dimensional models, but they don't talk to each other. They're like they're in completely different um, kind of landscapes of their of their own. Really challenging to, to bring into one model. We also have to make a number of trade-offs, and you know, so for instance, Rita and Elaine were really concerned about. Authenticity and accuracy and representing what we know and, and what was actually there. But to create a virtual reality experience where you're wearing a headset and you're using controllers to move around, we have to we have to make a few sacrifices to make a an immersive experience that that captured what was really there and also told the story that we wanted to tell. So some, some interesting challenges there. The other thing, and, and I was really struck by this recently when I was helping Rita get ready for the demo that she's doing next week, the examples that are out there to follow in terms of what a good kind of digital cultural heritage virtual reality experience should be, there just aren't very good examples. I mean, what, what we did with a student programmer and me working part-time and stuff like that on this and on the side, it almost stands out as one of the best examples. And obviously, I'm not objective, but when I compare it to things that I've seen, both in, in like on Oculus Quest or in um, the HTC Vive store, there just is not that much out there. Um, and I'll come back to that because I think what we're seeing is that the best best examples are in various kinds of computer games, right? Where we've seen those kind of environments um, and cultures, cultures represented in a certain way in a game context. And so those people obviously have a different agenda, right? They're developing games, they're trying to make money, and they're the ones that are really investing in, you know, representing cultures, you know, to the, to the end of having, having a game that someone will, get, will buy. And so I think we, we really have the responsibility to Take, you know, this is Ruth Tringham speaking. We have the responsibility to, to, to do this work in this space so that we can be using this information, presenting it, and having the kind of dialogues that we know we need to have to be responsible um, with, with the kinds of cultural information that we'd like to be able to, to, to share with others. So that's a big part of my reason for, for doing that. Now, another project, sorry, 1230, okay. Another project that I've been involved with that's been coming out from, from this work is uh, we've, we've developed an XR community of practice on campus. 
XR is kind of extended for extended reality. So virtual reality, augmented reality, and a colleague and I, Owen McGrath, have formed the, the XR community of practice, which we have some you know, small pocket of funding from campus. Mainly we're hiring students, buying like a little bit of equipment, and it's really to try to bring together the different pockets of, of excellence that do exist on this campus. So we have people right next door in architecture who are really doing fascinating work in virtual reality. We have people in the College of Engineering and in Computer Science who are developing hardware and software um, in virtual reality and augmented reality. But nobody's doing anything kind of campus-wide. And since I work in kind of a, a central group here on campus with my colleague, Rick Jaffe, uh, you know, our, our perspective is, is campus-wide. What, what kinds of services or, or spaces or tools would be helpful to the different Different people working in different disciplines. Right? So this, this is how we call it a service design experience to try to figure out well, what would you as an archaeologist like to have available. So that's that's what this is kind of an experiment in that in that vein. We have four main themes that we're looking at in, in developing this community of practice. One is accessibility. But how do we make sure, and in both definitions of that word, how can we make sure that these technologies are available to people with all sorts of you know, uh, abilities and disabilities. Right? So obviously for something like this, somebody who has vision impairments, how can they still you know, not be left out of, of this kind of experience? Um, a classic example of this is if you think about, um, and we've all been using Zoom a lot for classrooms and for experiences like this, there are now kind of virtual reality spaces that are available as well. Well, how do we make sure that we're not leaving anybody out if we're using some of these social VR environments as part of our learning and, and public service missions here at the university? But accessibility also access to content and technology that is currently very expensive. How do we make sure that we're, we're being inclusive? So then some of these other topics I think will be of, of great interest. Curation, how can we make sure that the content that we're developing is high quality, that it's reusable, so that information doesn't get lost in a file format that, that doesn't, doesn't really work anymore where it's not supported? What are the things that we can do to make sure that we, people can find the content that was developed 10, 15, 20 years ago for another excavation, for instance? How do we make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing with the information that we have. How do we make sure it's interoperable so that it's not so hard to take something from a GIS application and something from photogrammetry and bring it into one experience? And then security and privacy. How do we make sure just this whole host of ethical action, ethical issues about um, with virtual reality in particular, the the information that these headsets can gather about eye tracking and what are you actually looking at. Um, when people are starting to build in other kinds of biometric sensors, like um, are you sweating? Are you are you getting nervous? You know, those kinds of things. That's really that is data that's very you know, sensitive, obviously. So what are the things you need to do to make sure people know as they use virtual reality, augmented reality? that they understand what kind of information has been gathered about their accounts being used. Okay. So we did, we've done a bunch of kind of experiments, developing some applications that work on the iPad and, and other devices. I won't, I won't go through that, but happy to return to that as well. So that's going to be All right, so let's look at our arcade experience. What, what can we do with, with this now? So Nico and I have talked about a few things that kind of build on the work that I've been doing, and that includes, I mean, we haven't actually done a demonstration of, we do a demo, five minutes. Okay, we, for that Catalyst publication, for that Catalyst project that I started talking about that brought this facility here, we have an application that was developed um, by the computer scientists down at UC San Diego. And in that application, you start at the level of the globe, and there are you know, several, there are 
six sites that are actually where we brought in 360 degree images into this into this application. And so for instance, I can say that I want to go to the site of Luxor and view some 360 photos. And this one's very dark. If I get to a more well-lit area, you can see that we are able to actually navigate around this site in 360 degrees. Right? We go to the next site here for the next 360 video or image rather, and you know, look around this location. So, so this was the original purpose of this of this cave kiosk, as it was called, was to share these kind of images so that if you couldn't go to Egypt, you could go to a museum or a library and see this space. And if I go back, you can see we have um, we do have some. And the archaeological sites. This is a site that Tom Levy from San Diego worked on. Um, there's some marine archaeology that he's doing down there. And then there's some, some archaeological context here. And this is a way to put somebody in that location um, and people could then learn more about that archaeological site. Well, theoretically, we can add more 360 images to this same application. So that's one of the things I'd like to explore is how can we add Chateauhoya to, to this site, for instance, or to this, to this application. Um, as we did in the first museum, we can certainly do more photogrammetry develop 3D models from other collections. And, and that's something we actually have the material, you know, the, the tools right here at the, at the ARC to do some of that work. There's also a photogrammetry of whole archeological sites. So as a way to develop a three-dimensional model of an archeological site, this, this is a resource that we could, we could take advantage of. Nico's gonna talk about some related ideas in a little bit. Uh, and then I'm really interested in continuing work on kind of applications and experiences in, our, in AR and VR. And so I'm really interested if, if there are others that want to explore how to you know, take some of these three-dimensional representations and then you know, tell stories through those and share our interpretations and use those as a platform to then allow others to you know, have a dialogue with us about cultural heritage. Um, I know Meg, for instance, she has over there in the corner, she has a, a, a bulletin board about movies, right? And she and I talked, I talked a little bit about what could we do to have this be a platform for talking about looting, right? And then teaching people about our looting past. Now then, I also want to have conversations about how to do this appropriately, right? And I'll tell a little story here. So when I was working with the students in the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, we were trying to find some objects that would be a good collection for them to work on. They would also be kind of good to kind of showcase why this was good work to do. And uh, Katie Fleming, then at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, um, brought us to a collection of Japanese Mexico. And these are objects that are really wonderful. They're often carved in ivory or wood. They're part of typically a, a man's garment um, that was kind of used to, to hold a, a sash and, and some other you know, things here that would be part of a little um, pocket, like a little external pocket that would hold things in it. So these Mexican are very unique, they're very collectible, and the Hearst Museum has an interesting collection of Mexican. So we, we started to we develop you know, 20 or 25 models, three-dimensional models of these Metsuke from the Hearst Museum. And I'm sorry that Junko Habu can't be here because when she saw some of these models, she was like, these are awful. They're clearly for the tourist trade. You know, I, I don't really think you should show those here. So that really foregrounded to me that we have to be having a dialogue with people. It's not just about showing fancy things. We have to be really thinking and, and talking with people about what we're doing and why. Because as we know, archaeology and museums are in such a special place right now, right? And such a hard and will continue to be so important that we have those dialogues. So 
I think that this platform can help us have those kind of conversations because I think we all know just because something is digitized and is a picture doesn't mean that it's any less sensitive or culturally important to somebody, right? So how can we make sure that we as archaeologists are really making sure how you know, to really advance how we have those conversations? Okay, so that's those are the kind of things I'm really hoping to get out of having this, but bring this back to my academic home, right? And it started here many years ago. As we can talk. Okay, so um, Nico, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague Nico, my collaborator. I will turn off the application and then, um, if you want to drive or if you want me to drive. Um, I might come back to it, just in the interest of time. So I've been um, trying to think of research applications of this machine. And uh, in addition to the photogrammetry potential that Chris mentioned, this PC behind the, behind the screens here has two eight gigabyte Gra uh, graphics processing units, which are in 2017, that was a pretty high end. Um, essentially, it's a gaming machine. And it has, but it has double the graphics cards because one drives one set of screens and one drives another. Um, and those can be tasked by photogrammetry software for processing these hundreds, sometimes thousands of photos that are combined to calculate a point cloud, three dimensional point cloud. Um, so that's one possible application. I won't demonstrate that today, but it's, uh, it's something that you might have looking for. One sort of obvious use for people is Google Earth. I mean, it's a perfect vehicle for Google Earth. Now, uh, we have a skylight in this room, so it's very bright in here, but at night, this is probably much more compelling. Let's see, I include something very smart. We can imagine zooming in, standing around, um, exploring the possible uh, the study, right? Top down. You could, you could explore your uh, plan, your survey research with these big screens. And, and part of the, the difference from just using a computer or a laptop or even virtual reality goggles is that more than one person can stand here at the point. To discuss strategy, uh, so that's one possible use. Uh, I also thought it would be interesting to see how constructed spaces work. So let's fly over to close to us here in San Francisco. And in the case of urban settings, uh, in some places Google actually has the 3D data from you know, building data. So they really fly down. To Corridor here, go to the Moscone Center. That's one possible use. Okay, so another one is because of another possible use is in, in GIS software. This is a great display for GIS. Uh, geographical information systems. And we have ArcGIS below on here. You can do an evolution of Arc, the Esri ArcGIS suite. And uh, one thing that they're supporting now is more integrated three dimensional models. And this is what's called a voxel, which is, you know, in, in GIS, you have vectors or objects and you have rasters, which are essentially, think of a satellite image. Or a digital elevation model, those are classic examples of rasters. So a voxel is a three-dimensional raster. So instead of just you know, rows and columns of equally sized grid squares, you have cubes, equally sized cubes. And uh, geoscientists are using the voxel model to look at sub subsurface strata for calculating larger features that they that they've mapped out using geophysics. Um, so you, you know, 
you can potentially see using this you can cut across an archaeological site that you map in with say ground penetrating radar. So, so I ground and fire my RGIS pro on here. Oh, look, this is, this is anyway, uh, yeah, so that was an example of, of side data in RGIS Pro. And then um, a third example I thought I'd demonstrate this, this is almost like a profile, right? A stratigraphic profile at a deep archaeological site. So I thought it would be interesting to pull up some, some profiles uh, here. So I have examples from two of our scholars here. Um, we start with Ruth Tree and sent me some high resolution images from Chicago and the hard to maximize on this. Uh, so in terms of gathering around. Profile and you can really stand here and discuss this with you. He was just explaining that, let's see, this is a, can you pull up the diagram as well? We wrote that published um, diagram, that about the depiction of flight. And this is apparently a doorway that has been walled off in the post wall. I think that YouTube video is still coming back. I'm going to turn that off. Uh, so, so, yeah, this is a profile, and we have different strata here. Um, this is apparently a doorway, a post mold. So you can line these up or you can look at this kind of face here on the front of the screen. We have this midden layer below, which is a step and a little doorway that we can roll off. You can see the post mold. Uh, I'm going to have to show you another. Profile. And you can have start sending a profile from Shibita. And here we have this bird layer. And uh, kind of pairs to matrix of those woodworks. So that's another potential use of this system is, is using a pair. The Paris Matrix software run in This is a Java program that was written maybe 10 years ago. It's still run, unfortunately, on this computer. And I, I reconstructed. Uh, Paris Matrix and John and Moody Illustrator here in this Paris Matrix software. So you can really zoom in. You potentially gather around a profile like this and discuss the stratigraphy and discuss the Paris Matrix and sequence that you see. One of the features of the software is you can create stratigraphic. That you can, you can group certain sets of events or deposits into a single phase. And so it offers a potential for gathering around these large images. Let's talk. Do you see if there's any questions here on the? Let's see. Could we have a question here online? Could this screen and computer be used to display what's happening inside someone's VR headset to make a VR experience more shareable? Uh, 
Yes, that's a great question. And absolutely, um, this is a little hard, kind of depends on the equipment you're using. So the Oculus Quest now has a, has a pretty good means of, 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 what do they call it, the casting what you're seeing in VR into onto a computer screen. So, so yes, that is, that's a great idea. And something I'm interested in exploring for sure. You might need another gra uh, graphics card. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. You know, some of these devices, yeah, it, it, it all depends on the particular um, application you're working with. Yes, Christine. Yes, thank you very much. The first slide, you said that to you a while. So, well done. Um, so, if you were going to, you have that one snap of the profile, those groups in mind. If you want to make a 3D room like our love door room, what because we just talked about the depth of it, actually it's a field. And and my colleague Jose Charles was saying you could take between 30 to 200 photos. What do you need to do so you can reconstruct? He said, you know, gather the right information so that you can reconstruct it. Is it just an old photograph or something more than that? Yeah, so, so for people on um, Zoom, I'll repeat the question. So the question is, how do we create these three-dimensional models? Say of an archaeological site, do we just take a lot, is it take a lot of photographs? So there are a number of ways to generate these three-dimensional models now, these photogrammetry models. In, in photogrammetry, yes, we would typically take some large number of photographs that have to overlap by I think it's 30 to 40% is kind of the ideal. And then what you do is you use software that, um, and I skipped over like the, the whole difficulty of doing the photographs, it's really the exposure and the, um, you know, it's, it's a garbage in garbage out situation. If you take bad photographs, you will not get a good model. So taking good photographs is really key. It's one of the lessons I learned a hard way early on. Um, good photographs that overlap 30 to 40 percent is more. really important. Yeah. Even more, yeah. Okay, six. Yeah, and um, from different angles as well. So from from you know, straight on and from above and from below, and then you use software. And what the software does is it takes those all of those images and it uses that overlap to find points in common. Right. And so you, I think you heard Nico refer to a point cloud. So what the software is doing is it's trying to say, okay, that that fingertip is you know the same fingertip in this photo, this photo, and this photograph, right? And so it then creates sometimes tens or twenty, you know, thousands of, of points in, in a point cloud, and then you as as the user of the software can actually update and correct some of those you know, determinations that the software has made. And then from there, we'll create another a denser point cloud. And then if that point cloud looks good, you will actually try to connect the dots. And we'll say, okay, if those points are good, then I can create a, a, a surface, a polygon, right? That has a certain color, has a certain texture to it. And from there, it's able to create a three-dimensional model. So that, that's how I'm familiar with creating three-dimensional models. But there are new technologies out there, not even new, so new, like LIDAR is a great technology for creating three-dimensional models. Um, and you know, this is a very active area of, of technological development. I can now use my phone to create a three-dimensional model because it has a certain, actually my iPad is better, but there's software and hardware now out, even at the consumer level, to create some of these, these models. I feel like um, Christine was actually wanting to do as well, but it seems to me talking about reconstruction. Well, you said the word reconstruct, so I'm thinking that my question would be how difficult is it, assuming we have anything to do with the cave itself, but how difficult is it if you've just got wall stubs to reconstruct the rest of the wall? Right. I.e., the okay. rest of the wall. Okay. In perhaps to be able to um, discuss alternative interpretation. Right. right. How difficult would that be with that? Yeah, great question. So Ruth Freeman has asked, how could we use this 
to actually reconstruct archaeological sites from the archaeological remains, and then even use that use this as a format for you know, discussing different interpretations of what a reconstructed environment or site or you know, room might look like. Uh, I think that's a great question, and uh, you know I know that this is the work that archaeologists do, right? And I have seen there's been there has been some interesting work um, on just a few isolated, like, especially like I think classicists are really interested in this, right? So I've seen some Roman sites that have been kind of reconstructed, even in kind of a three-dimensional kind of walkthrough, right? So you could do a walkthrough of um, one of the, one of those sites. So I think that's a perfect application. I wonder if you could also use augmented reality in some way or another, so that you could split the different mm -hmm. models. Yeah, so I saw a very interesting talk a few years ago here where they were using augmented reality to to put artifacts back into the site so you could kind of populate the space. So it was a combination. And I, and I think they were actually bottled or hmm, maybe it was just foam. It was a foam pan around. So the geometry stays the same, but now you can you know, put, put a cook pot on the part. Right. Yeah, Sarah. So I wonder if you showed those uh, Roman sites and they were like the that yeah so the question that sarah had was is there you know, instead of or in addition to just having you know, the, the three-dimensional you know, videos the 363 videos is there something we could do to actually then add some interpretive kind of components so that you can learn more, you could look at some of the data, you know, could drill into certain aspects of the, of the archaeology? Yes, that's where you know, it would take developing some kind of application in order to take the, the raw content and then add you know, annotations or some kind of ability to navigate. Um, this is really interesting to me. I've been um, thinking a lot and actually doing some some classes on how to design these applications right because this is this is again there's no standards for this right except what may be being developed in kind of gaming context but for yeah which are expensive and take a lot of money but for for the kind of applications we would want to develop you know what is the right way to navigate to provide some kind of annotation how do we and since this is mostly about kind of immersive visualization, we in archaeology, I think we, we're used to data and maybe lots of text as well. So how do we how do we you know, provide enough context and information, but also recognize kind of the limitations of the technology and maybe you know who our intended audience is as well? And yeah, I think a lot of this is being developed quickly because you know, these announcements we hear about Meta and. Did Microsoft buy Ubisoft? Is that, I think that was okay. There were big acquisitions by Microsoft to compete yeah. with you know, Facebook Meta. But um, one of the discussions I saw was whether we want to really give this over to these companies in terms of establishing standards, mm -hmm. or should this be more of a, an open forum for the yeah. public so it doesn't so it's not just dominated by a couple of big players, but it's an open standard, you know, yeah. along the lines of HTML. Right. That's how I, I saw Red, Ruth's hand and then your hand. I'm, I'm still following on from what um, with the whole question of whether this is this is a democratization or visualization basically. That's why you're saying it was constructed so that it, it was easy for a museum to to get one and use it. And so it seems to me that uh, that you have to ask the question: Is does it always have to be so expensive to make a video, to make a game that uses video? or immersive through the visualization. Right, right. Doesn't have to be so expensive. No time and so yeah. on. Yeah. Fortunately, this is one of the things that's happened recently is the development of these kind of social XR spaces. You know, there are companies trying to create kind of the Zoom killer. How could we have some other kind of more immersive environment that we could join in for work or for, for socializing conferences conferences and fortunately those are kind of 
forcing the development of some standards, right? Because they, you know, companies need to bring in their own content for their own conference or something. So, you know, we're uh, we're definitely experimenting with platforms like uh, Mozilla Hubs and Spatial, and Facebook has Meta has its own kind of um, social XR environment. But those are those are showing some promise. Um, I, that's one of the things our students are doing is evaluating some of those to see like how, again, they were, they were developed for a different purpose. How would they work in, in a higher ed environment? Um, yes, you have a question. Yeah, I was wondering, currently, who can use the art movement? Is there a system in place for, like, say, yeah. a graduate student wanting to visualize maps or, mm -hmm. say, undergraduates who are associated with the UGRAP program or the faculty lab here? Could they use the art to pay for visualizing, say, photographs that they've taken, microscope level, they want to put them on the screen, or they want to use photographic technology to make 3D models of the scene or something that they can move around? Who, who can use it and how can people? Yeah, great question. I'm so glad you asked that question because that is kind of the next thing, which is how do we make, how can students, how can faculty, others use this resource? So, you know, Nico and I have talked just at kind of a high level about how this can be a facility that you know, people could reserve time. They could you know, check it out, so to speak, and, and then use it. And so I think that's the next step is for us to actually develop you know, the, the appropriate system for, for people to, to use the environment. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about doing is actually maybe having, you know, where I'll be here for a couple hours each week. And so I'll you know, work with Nico and find a time that um, where I could come over and be just be around and let people know so that if they're here, they could. And then I'm also also available, and so is my colleague Rick Jaffe, who's here. We can come over and, you know, when, when people are actually available. So we'll make sure, my, well, my email is chris underscore h at berkeley.edu. You can find me on the calendar as well. And Nico has all my, my information. So I you can say like office hours? Yeah. Office hours or, yeah. Or uh, ask for a lot of hours, say, Yeah. Do you think something like that would, would like work? Or like have a workshop where they say, what's the term? Uh, like, okay, I'm here to teach. Yeah. If our has all these workshops, this could be a workshop. Right? Oh, I love that. All the undergrads and grads could sign up for that workshop. Yeah. That's all. Uh, the green college to come over and now the screen to be It did get very dark all of a sudden. <laughs> Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, yeah. question on the chat. No, we're at 104. Would be great to link the models to TDAR or Ochre. Excellent. Um, I am not familiar with Ochre. Is that another like a repository for, um, for this kind of information? O C H R E? Okay. Yeah, it's. Um out of the University of Chicago, I think, and they're doing a lot with, um, you know, creating a kind of multifunctional archeological database, you know, like these other ones where you can have a field application and then it's automatically um, yeah. in your database that then you continue to work with in the lab. And we've been connecting some of, some Ochre information from the Amachi project to things like Esri story maps so that they're they're linked between GIS data and the Ochre database because it's all, you know, um, it's all on servers. So it would be cool to have some of these virtual reality models, especially in sort of fixed setups like this, that you are just sort of see a slight gesture towards you know, there's more information here and click on it and get the whole sort of database entry for yeah. an artifact or something. I love that idea. Thank you. I, I, every time I talk to somebody about visualization like this or VR, <laughs> AR, I learn something. So, so thank you. Yeah, that would be exciting. Of, yeah. Like you could have a clickable object that takes you to some of the VOI with more information on the web. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, I love that. Yeah, thank you. These are, this I'd love to hear other ideas like this, or examples of resources or work that people are doing because there's there is a lot happening. It's just 
kind of scattered. We know there's a lot of essentially three dimensional clip art out there. If you're you know remodeling your kitchen, you can get clip art from That's you true. know from all the like dishwasher companies and you know, <laughs> pop it into SketchUp and they've really got made it a lot easier. You don't have to drive by hand and That's true. And you can follow that with archaeological <laughs> examples. <laughs> but it's not very realistic. At that point, we're talking about sort of public presentation and not with, um, research. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other? Yes. Well, questions? Question. 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 Question there's so much interesting work going on in the medical fields where they're actually developing virtual reality and augmented reality applications for you know, teaching people how to say do surgery or plan for surgery surgery. Um, so in medical fields, they've done some incredible advances in using those technologies, even, even to aid in an active surgery. Robotic yeah, surgery. and robotic surgery, really interesting confluence between um, robotics, VR, AR, and AI technologies. It's kind of shaking a lot of things up right now. So, so there's a lot of work going on in training for medical fields, also in um, kind of factory context and manufacturing as well, both for training and in the actual um, you know, factory work. Um, higher ed is a little behind, I would say. Maybe not, maybe not surprising, but people are exploring. I'm, I'm part of a, a higher ed community group that's, you know, kind of talking about these things. So again, you find an interesting example of that. there's actually someone using Second Life to teach um, Japanese. So there's a Japanese island in Second Life still. We hate Second Life now. <laughs> Understood. Second Life doesn't like No. Okay. We're just saying the second life doesn't like higher ed. I, 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 I totally believe you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how, you know, but there are maybe some other projects that are doing something interesting there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this could be used for teaching and interpretation, drawing, drawing, sticking out here. Mm -hmm. And teaching what it typically looks like, and get up close and say, This is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Change in soil depth before it's like, you know, the resolution is fantastic. I know. Yeah. In some ways, it's not no different than our overhead in the other room. Oh, it's not too different. I think it's better. The light is more clear than here. Yeah. And you can stand here and not shadow yeah. and not project. Right. Yeah. You could actually. It's well, this, this green, you know, I don't know something about it. Well, it's very high resolution LED screen. These are also, I mentioned, 3D TVs. So you can actually use the glasses and if you have a 3D application, and actually that catalyst application that we looked at, there is a mode that it runs in three dimensions as well. So we haven't even talked about that. And it's, you know, that's when 3D TVs were kind of the craze, but you can't even buy them anymore. It's a, Technology that did not catch on, but these are 3D TVs. So we are at 110. Uh, let me just see if there's any other. I don't see any other questions, but um, mm -hmm. thank you to everybody online, especially those who came to see us. Yeah.